25,000 feet into a net with no parachute. You know what? I never doubted him. Are you ready? All right, let's go. Manufacturing is sexy. Sounds crazy? Just wait. I'm Z Holly, host of The Art of Manufacturing. Your behind the scenes look at how people who make stuff are trying to make it in their industries. If you've ever wondered how to build a brand, a business, or just a better mousetrap, tune in and enjoy. This week's guest started his career shoeing horses and inseminating cows in Puerto Rico before he decided to become a manufacturer. It was Julio Ruiz's passion for skydiving, combined with a natural talent in graphic design, that gave him the crazy idea to start an action sports apparel company, Liquid Sky. Today, they're the top custom apparel company for skydiving and other extreme sports. I went to visit his company in Burbank, California, home of several movie studios, which is probably no coincidence since he does a lot of work for Hollywood as well. I parked in the alley and he was waiting for me in the back doorway with his tape measure hanging around his neck, which he never took off all day. <laughs> and we walked through the facility, which was tiny. I was surprised that this modest small business was cranking out apparel for my skydiving heroes like Luke Akins and Felix Baumgartner and celebrities like Tom Cruise. He introduced me to his team, proudly showed off some of his newest equipment, showed me this vast collection of materials in all sorts of weird colors. His fanciest jumpsuits use spandex, four-way, cordura, and neoprene all in each sleeve. And then we set up a makeshift studio in his little retail storefront. We were surrounded by skydiving photos, GoPro videos were playing, jumpsuits were hanging everywhere all around us, and the occasional customer strolled in. I was curious how Julio manages to make custom apparel for all of his customers when he's such a small business with uneven demand. And I also wanted to learn about the technology he uses to make customization easier, like computer-aided pattern making and digital manufacturing and how a small business like his adopts these technologies. We also hear some of his fun stories about working with Hollywood and extreme athletes. Liquid Sky is definitely not your typical apparel company, and Julio Ruiz is definitely not an average entrepreneur. We hear about that and a whole lot more on this week's episode of The Art of Manufacturing. I remember actually being three, jumping from the bumper of my dad's car with a little cape <laughs> like for me flying was and I know it was three because that's when I lived in San Germán where I was born and I moved there when I was four so that I super clear a blue station wagon a white cape that my mom had done some little artwork with like a marker or something and that was my Superman cape awesome so I always loved flying one day I was um uh watching the movie Point Break boom I said, I want to do this forever. I want to be a skydiver. Point Break was uh, Patrick Swayze's and Keanu Reeves' super awesome movie. They were uh, bank uh, robbers. You know, they used yeah. to rob banks and use that money for traveling, for surfing, all that cool stuff. When I saw that movie that they went skydiving, I said, man, I want to do this forever. And you did that in Puerto, Puerto Rico? Yeah. yeah. A pure coincidence is that that same year, there was the aerial invasion which is Invasión Aérea. It was a huge air show in Puerto Rico. And I saw these skydivers doing a show. So I approached them. I said, what do I have to do to become skydivers? I said, well, we have classes. It's every month. You can come and um, get the class. Our next class is in December. So, whoa. I had just turned 18, which I was pretty lucky that that was the minimum age. Old school skydiving, which where you were jumping out of a low altitude, it was like 3,500 feet. And it was static line class. That's scary, the static line. I found that. It's a little bit scarier, but I don't know any better. You know, <laughs> so for me, that that's what it is. Tell me about how the idea of Liquid Sky came and how you're serving the customer. Because it originally was for skydivers, right? Jumpsuits yes, for skydivers. Yes. Well, Liquid Sky started, was created by me and my wife in 2004. I've been an art director for many years. I used to work in big agencies, graphic designing. And... I, it was too much work nonstop, and I wanted to do something new. I said, well, Chrissy, let's let's create a business. And we wanted to do a sushi place because we love sushi. <laughs> and I was like, nah. Then we said we were going to do bikinis and board shorts. 
<laughs> we went to the apparel side. I, I don't do anything regarding apparel. I didn't go to school for this. I'm a certified farrier. Yes. Uh, artificial inseminator <laughs> and an associate's degree in agriculture. Okay. So you've done everything. <laughs> uh-huh. And this is before I was a graphic designer. And farriers. Most people don't know that farriers. Farrier is a horseshoer. horseshoer. You know, I shoe horses and I specialize in Clydesdales and Percherons, 2,000 pound horses, me being 5'10 and 170. <laughs> so it but was that, fun. But that wasn't exciting enough. No. Inseminating cows was not exciting enough. You wanted I to was already a, a skydiver all this time. Yeah. Right. So. I decided that I wanted to do the, uh, you know, the whole apparel stuff. And my brother-in-law said, why are you going to do board shirts and bikinis if you don't even surf? I, why don't you make skydiving jumps? I said, oh, beautiful <laughs> idea. You know, that was right. It was right there in my face and I never thought about it. And so literally in two days or in a day, I already had the name the logo, my wife came up with the awesome Liquid Sky name. Me being a, a graphic designer came up with the logo, started researching fabrics, started calling places. And in a little bit less than a year, I was already selling my first jumpsuit. Mm. Um, yeah, it took me a little bit because I was already working. I, I had a big commitment with uh, agencies that I work, freelance clients. So I started working on on making jumpsuits. So this was just a moonlighting side gig. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, I had a building where I had uh, seven employees graphic designing for me. And it first started doing jumpsuits in my house, in one of the rooms. Taking the measurements to a lady in another city. She making the pattern, bringing it back, me cutting, bringing it to her daughter, which was sewing. And it was back and forth for a few months until I found a lady that I was able to get her a sewing machine in her house. So it was a little bit easier. She was also a pattern maker. So it just kept on growing like that until the moment that I said, you know what? I have an extra room in my, in my building. Let's make Liquid Sky. So Maria, my Venezuelan uh, seamstress, and myself started working Liquid Sky in a very small room. Maybe, I don't know, 20 by 20. And where, what city was this? This is in, in Puerto Rico. Yeah. In, Sa in Santurce, in Puerto Rico, where I had my designing agency. And I, I, it was like literally across the hallway. So I was running to my office to work with the designs, running back to, the, to Liquid Sky to work with jumpsuits. We were making maybe two to three suits a week. Hmm. I traveled to California, to the Chicks Rocks Boogie which is every year in October. That was the second year of the boogie. A boogie is a skydiving event where mm -hmm. people go hang out. An excuse to spend money and jump <laughs> and, and get a raffle and win a jumpsuit and win jump tickets, stuff like that. So I flew there and in one day I sold 13 jumpsuits. Whoa. I didn't know what I was going to do with so many orders that I got in one day. And when I got back home, I literally started taking over the West Coast. Me being from Puerto Rico, 100 by 35 little island, you know, super small, started taking over the, over the West Coast. Why? Because we had a type of custom jumpsuit that was fashion. I was not the creator of that trend. It was another company, but they were not, they were just not there. They were not, they didn't want to grow. They didn't have that vision that I had. So immediately I took over them. They actually sold. The owner sold because she couldn't handle the pressure. I just kept on growing. And then being so close to Miami, I mean, California was already growing, but me being so close to Miami, I started traveling to Miami, started sponsoring athletes in Miami. And now I took over the East and the West Coast. Amazing. So tell me, what was the what was the state of the art in jumpsuits back then? What year was well, this? Uh, Fitting of the jumpsuit was more like a straight cut, very basic jumpsuits, uh, shirt, sleeves, pants, nothing too fancy. But what made it really cool was applique. We did a lot of application, tribals, graffitis, all this cool stuff, cut out of fabric, glued on the suit, zigzag with a 20U, really awesome, cool designs. And that was the fashion in skydiving. What's a zigzag with a 20U? A zigzag machine. Yeah. 
It's a Zinger, Zinger 20U machine. It's, it's the best zigzag machine that they've <laughs> ever built. It's the best. It's, it's an awesome zigzag machine. It's straight and zigzag. Mm -hmm. uh, and what year was this? 2006, 2007. Yeah. Custom suits were not that common either? Well, they were they? very... No, it was tie-dye and checker pattern. But how about the fit? Is the no, fit loose. What happens is that the sport has been evolving a lot. And back in the day, we used to fly on our bellies. In the early 2000s, people started flying on their heads and sit, mm -hmm. right? So now it's a different type of jumpsuit. No one still knew enough to start experimenting with jumpsuits. Now, little by little, we started already adding articulation on the suits. Why? Because now that you're flying on your head, You're going faster. You need a little bit tighter suit because the amount of drag on the suit mm. slows the fall, but also bothers the flying. So we started going tighter. What happens when you go tighter? You got to get more elastic, right? So we started adding articulation on the elbows, articulation on the knees, a little bit on the lower back. And the jumpsuits kept on going tighter and tighter until what they are today, that they're practically lycra. Not for every type of flying is like that. But for most of the type of free flying, which is what many people do, it's a very fitted jumpsuit. So it's been evolving. Um, I cannot say that I'm first generation jumpsuit manufacturers, but maybe maybe second generation because for such a long time, it was the same thing over and over. And then after Liquid Sky came in and some of the other modern uh, companies, we started developing, studying the body, the art of flying, faster fabrics. Uh, tighter fabrics that give you more power. Really? Uh, yeah. Oh, so yeah. tell me more. What are the different textiles that you use? And well, what is it like to you know, incorporate these? Oh, in? well, the, we started with Taslon, which is also known as Suplex. It's a nylon. It's a really nice fabric. It's made for outerwear, for sports outerwear. And it's a weave? Yeah. We started using spandex, jumbo spandex, which was really good. But what happened with some of that old school jumbo spandex is that for it to stretch, it has hundreds of little rubber bands inside. What happens with the needle goes through the rubber band and it stretches and stretches and stretches. At some point, their little rubber band is going to come out. So you could see all these little hairs of rubber band. Mm -hmm. So we upgraded to moleskin spandex, which is a smoother elastic. And uh, little by little... I was noticing that we needed more and better colors. And due to the sport evolving so fast in the wind tunnel industry, not only skydiving, we needed windproof suits. And what happens with the um, with the spandex, it's not windproof. Mm. Okay, So I found neoprene. The thinnest neoprene that they manufacture is 0.5 millimeter. So it's a very thin rubber uh, layer of fabric. A layer of rubber and another layer of fabric. So I started getting really cool color combinations. Right? What's the favorite color? Your favorite? Oh, uh, well, my suit favorite that you did color. My favorite color. And my my old school colors were purple, black, and neon yellow. Okay. Right? It definitely so, would look good in the photos. Oh yeah, that's the thing. <laughs> uh, red, white, and royal blue are the best colors for the sky. Definitely. Unfortunately, a lot of skydivers now these days love black. I still like the 1992 colors, you know, the magentas, <laughs> the turquoise, the hot yeah. pinks. I even have a textile that I designed that it's called 1992 because it just reminds <laughs> me to those years of me in high school, graduating, starting skydiving when all our colors were like my first jumpsuit was not my brand, right? It was another brand. It was magenta, purple, And neon yellow. Oh, my God. Like, it looked awesome, right? <laughs> and right now, there's a lot of professional skydivers that rock all those cool colors. One thing that I learned and I've noticed in the sport is that you have to be very confident in the sport to wear very confident colors. If you're not too good in the sport, you will never wear pink or turquoise. <laughs> Many guys that are really good say, no, I want a little bit of pink because real men wear pink. <laughs> yeah, you I know? love it. You have and, nothing to compensate for, right? <laughs> no. And I mean, in the sky, there's nothing cooler than cool colors. 
So you say being good at skydiving and being confident. Most people don't understand the uh, levels of what you can get into in skydiving oh, and yeah. the different the, the the nuances in it. And so maybe you can talk a little bit about the different kinds of skydiving and different skills that you might yes. want to. I mean, oh, I don't yeah. have that there, many jumps myself, no, so I've never. There, there is a lot. There is a lot in skydiving. Skydiving back in the day used to be falling from the sky. Zero purpose. Zero purpose. You just were a potato drop from the, an airplane. That's it. Little by little, people say, you know what? Let's try to grab each other in the sky. And it just kept on evolving to the point where we don't call it falling. We call it flying. Because even though we're falling out of an airplane and we fall in style, our body moves in these cool body positions that allow us to go slower, go faster, move left, move right, duck on a person, super precise, so precise that you can be falling on your head and your partner falling on, on a sit position at 150 mile an hour and we can touch forehead with forehead and not feel it. Wow. Yeah, you got to have a lot of jumps. You got to yes. know your partner a lot. But there's a lot you can do without any pressure. Um, there's many disciplines. There's wingsuit flying, which is what people call the squirrel suits. Uh, that used to be just flying a suit with wings. And that's it. Now, people jump out of cliffs from them uh, with them and then fly really close to the cliffs. Proximity flying. Proximity flying. In skydiving, there's a cool thing called XRW, which they mix the wingsuiter with the canopy pilot. Why? Because now the canopies has, have also evolved so much that the wings that we fly are so fast that it would be considered like a fighter jet because of the way that the parachute has also evolved into being such an efficient wing. They're not parachutes anymore. Yeah. They're wings. Same thing happens with the wingsuits. They're not wingsuits. They're little airplanes made out of fabric that you get in them. <laughs> you know, that's that's what they are. Yeah. Um, same thing has happened with the jumpsuit. It used to be a jumpsuit. Now it's your flying apparel. It's like... Do you do wingsuits? Do you make I, wingsuits? I was a wingsuit instructor from the old school. Mm -hmm. um, do you make them? No, I don't make wingsuits. It's pretty advanced, the technology on wingsuit, and I can make a wingsuit, but I would need to hire an aeronautical engineer to work at my shop. You've expanded your focus, though, beyond just uh, jumpsuits yeah. and not in the wingsuit direction, but it, for no. other sports. So tell yeah. me about how you made that decision well, to do that. Well, since the day that we started, we never called this company Liquid Sky Jumpsuits. Because I was not going to make just jumpsuits. I wanted to make cool action sports apparel. The, I don't even know the, the, if the word action sport existed in 2004. Maybe it was extreme. But I wanted to make cool apparel for, for sports. So me, I was a mountain biker, downhill mountain biker after I moved here to California. And I started making mountain biking pants, which is very similar to just a cool extra strong board short, you know? But I found out that the, that that market is not used to custom. They just go to the store, grab a 60 pair, $60 pair of pants, and they buy them. In skydiving, we're used to buying everything in our colors, in our mm -hmm. size, fully custom. I don't care if it cost me $250. But most of the market, most of the industry, we're yeah. not into it. Yeah, we started making jerseys. That was good. But I wanted to make a little bit more technical stuff. It didn't work out so well. We still make them and we still sell them, but it's not a big market. I started karting. Being here in California, you can do so many cool sports that I, I try karting. And in no time, I was sponsoring a few athletes. I made my suit. I made their suit and they all loved it. And I I said, you know what? I'm going to start with the karting industry. Karting is go-karting, like a super fast go-kart, 70 Tell mile an hour. how that works. The suit or the karting? No, no, the karting. Well, the karting is you have you have a very small go-kart. <laughs> you get on it. You have to be a very good driver if you're gonna compete. Like if you're gonna if you're gonna go to a place and rent an indoor kart, anyone can do it. If you're gonna go to a real track and get a race go-kart, 
you sh- you got to go with a coach. You got to learn little by little how to recognize a turn, a left-hand turn, a right-hand turn, how to enter your turns and exit your turns, how to brake, give angle because the car doesn't have suspension. It's not like a regular car. It's y- your body, the angle, the weight, the speed. It's what drives the vehicle. I want to try this. Where can it's I try it? It's super awesome. Well, Adams Motorsports Park in Riverside, All right. awesome racetrack. They're my friends. I actually sponsored his son, the owner's son. The karting industry opened a door of of custom. Um, the only problem is that they're not used to waiting 12 weeks for a jumpsuit like skydivers are because of the high demand. So we had to we had to start making karting suits on another production line that starts at two weeks because if not, they're not gonna do it. They're just gonna grab something from the shelf. But uh, but at least we were able to enter the market, and this is a, this is the market we've been on that market like three years. It's, it's new to us, but this year is when we decided to step it up another notch and go homologated. Homologation is a license that you get by an association in Europe that makes your suit a professional suit for the European market. And the requirements of that homologation most likely are going to be fire retardant, fire resistant. In carding, is just abrasion. Is that like UL certified? It's CIA, CIKFIA. Yeah, yeah. That is who gives you the homologation license. That's the same for rock climbing equipment, I think. For Some, many sp- similar, yeah. for many sports in Europe, you have to be homologated. If I sell my suits. Anywhere outside Europe, I don't have to be homologated. Mm -hmm. One of the problems that I was having is one of my best drivers drives Liquid Sky here. But when he drives Le Mans or any place outside the United States, which would be in Europe, he needs to wear another jumpsuit. So how many spokespeople do you have now? Well, I uh, in the sport I have in skydiving, I have a lot of sponsor athletes. I have ambassadors. They're very similar. The ambassador just doesn't compete, but it's it's an, a pretty girl, a good talker, a nice guy that flies a lot and travels to many events. And because of him, we sell suits because of what people see. In what, 15 years? I've never advertised on a magazine. Hmm. And if you look behind you, <laughs> you're going to see a bunch of covers of magazines with my brand in it. That mm-hmm. is my advertising. I give a really cool suit to an athlete. I make him my sponsor athlete, and that is my billboard. People walking with jumpsuits, people being on uh, magazines with my jumpsuit, that's my type of advertising. So that's that's what's going to happen with the carding. We might be uh, posting an ad on one of the carding magazines, but maybe not. You know, it would be awesome that we didn't have to. We just got to go to the events, show up, have champions, have good ambassadors, and start making more suits. Carding, we're entering and we're not going to have inventory, but we're going to have stock sizes because the carding suit does not have to be so precise in fitting. It's comfortable. It should look good, and we're going to have anywhere from 48 to 65 or 60 size suits. That's how they get called in um, in the carding industry. Instead of small, medium, large, they call them 52, 54, 56. And each size has a uh, specific measurement that would fit, let's say, an extra small, small, a small, medium, a medium, large, a large, extra large. You know, it mm-hmm. jumps but you can get the custom colors, custom. But well, you can get the custom colors. Yeah. You see, it. so let's realistically, it takes me less than a day to manufacture a jumpsuit. Let's say that you show up at my shop at 8 a.m. You come at 3 p.m. and you get your jumpsuit fully decked, fully custom, fully embroidered. I don't care what you want on it. We're capable of doing that. But you don't do it in a day or two now. You have a backlog. Well, right? In the skydiving industry, people have to wait 10 to 12 weeks. We offer rush service for the client that comes, let's say, from Dubai. We have a lot of clients from Dubai, Qatar, Abu Dhabi, Bahrain. 
they Australia, they travel here and they come get measured and they want to suit immediately. So they just pay the premium super rush fee and in three or four days they come get fitted and they take it. What's the difference between me making the jumpsuit in eight, eight to 12 weeks or 10 to 12 weeks, shipping it to Dubai. Now you got to pay $75 in shipping. You got to pay your duties when you get there. So now you waited eight weeks, you paid shipping, you pay all that stuff. That's a lot of money versus you paid that premium to me now and you have it in a week guaranteed. And you got yourself a vacation and in L.A. while you're waiting. There you go. <laughs> you see, no, yeah. I get I get a lot of people that travel to here to get measured. Most of the travelers are West Coasters, you know, or, or sometimes they come maybe Colorado, they fly here. I've had a friend that flew from California to Miami when I was there to get measured. People do it because when it's custom, it fits really nice. When you come to get fitted, it fits even better. What's your price point on the standard price point on a the jumpsuit? The basic jumpsuit starts at $325. That's custom? That's the basic price of our most basic model. The most sold jumpsuit, which is a Cosmo, starts at $565, basic. Custom colors is not extra ever. We do not charge anything extra for the co color combination. What is extra is if you want to have magnets instead of snaps, if you want to have Cordura knees and Cordura butt to protect you from landings, if you want to have a smartphone pocket. So you put your smartphone in the pocket and it comes in a little extra pouch just so the cell phone is not just flapping around. People pay extra for all that cool stuff because it's custom. Remember, the custom is so cool. There's so much you can do to custom. You can add your name. You can add your logo. Um, right now, we're at a level that we print fabric. Let's say that you want a special Pantone color that it's not available on fabric. Well, we can do it. Mm. You just tell me the Pantone, we print the fabric, and we make your jumpsuit. If you want your face in your jumpsuit, you can get it. <laughs> we work. Have you had that? No, but I have, I have people that wanted it, but at the end, they took it out, right? <laughs> But it would Probably. be so cool to have like my face on a jumpsuit and me, my I think background. I'd rather have Albert Einstein's face well, or something. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a lot. Like I have a friend that said, can you put my face on a girl riding a unicorn and make it into a jumpsuit? I, I, when you have a background of graphics and you're really good with Photoshop, with Illustrator, you can do a lot of cool things. <laughs> what's a the, lot of cool what's things. What's the weirdest design that you've had somebody request? Well, the weirdest design was... Uh, a jumpsuit that we made for a celebrity and it was pink and it had roses it was pretty weird but it was it came out really cool i've had people that can you, want can you say who it was i don't remember his name oh. <laughs> i don't remember his name he's a superstar i don't know i think he's a rapper okay um we've been here we've done a lot of uh celebrities which is really awesome because you never know who's gonna knock on your door and tell you i want a jumpsuit and if I can mention, I can, I can tell you, you know, like one of our latest jobs, which was last year, but it's airing now. We did Mission Impossible 6. They contact me because they've seen my brand. I made some jumpsuits that we're going to use for some test flying in London. And uh, the stunt coordinator liked my brand so much that I said, you know what? This is the jumpsuit that you guys have to use for the movie. So the wardrobe department came over. I met with the lead wardrobe director, which is a really well-known designer. And uh, we designed the jumpsuit that Tom Cruise and Henry Cavill were going to use on the movie. We said, you know what? I see what you can do. You design Tom Cruise jumpsuits and we make him happen. But he did not want just a black. He wanted a black that would look good on Tom Cruise. So we end up... Doesn't all black look good on Tom Cruise? Well, most things look good on him, especially, <laughs> you know, when you're a high caliber actor like him, when you have such of an awesome every department behind you. But the cool thing is, is that it was black that we printed, but we added 
a lot of little, little, tiny, tiny squares of charcoal gray that gave the textile texture. Because they wanted to use textures on the fabric, but for skydiving, with the flopping of the wind, with all the stuff that they want to do, I said, you know what? We should use what I can offer. So we mix a bunch of our polyesters. So we have hundreds of textiles that we can use to print. And we came out with really cool designs. For Henry Cavill, we didn't want a pretty green. We wanted an ugly green because he was the bad guy. So he couldn't look better than Tom Cruise. <laughs> And it was, it was really cool. It was really, really, a really cool experience. We've worked with a bunch of other actors. We've done suits for David Blaine, the magician. The most cool stuff was that not only he got a suit from us, he did a, almost an hour of magic in my office for all my employees. Uh, that was awesome. Um, Bear Grylls, the survivalist from uh, oh yeah. uh, London. Uh, it was a Land Rover commercial. We've worked with... Uh, Ken Young for a movie that he did with uh, Hassel Hove and uh, Holt Hogan, Melissa McCarthy, Logan Paul. What was that one for? Oh, uh, it's the, the one that it's airing now, uh, Life of the Party. Okay. That one airs now. Like it's, I think it just started or it starts now. We've done Intel commercials. We've done a bunch of commercials, uh, Jeep, uh, Vonage commercials, Samsung commercials. Looking up on the wall right now, I see a picture of the Luke Aikens jump where yeah. he, he landed without a parachute. Yeah, Did that's you... that's the one that I was just going to tell you now. That was uh, almost two years ago in Simi Valley. Luke is one of the Red Bull Air Force athletes. Really good friend. I've One of my first sponsor athletes. He's been flying Liquid Sky. My God. If we've been on the market for 15 years, he's been flying Liquid Sky 14. You know, wow. something like that. That's amazing. Really cool guy. Very professional stunt person. Uh, and he comes one day and says, Julio, we're doing this. I said, you're crazy. He said, no, we're doing this. And I need you to help me. And describe this. So this is, I'm going to jump out of 25,000 square feet. I mean, 25,000 feet. And I'm going to land on a net that it's only 100 by 100 suspended from the ground, only 300 feet. So land, and the cool thing is that I'm not going to have a parachute. a parachute. You're not going to have a parachute. Yeah. So again, 25,000 feet into a net with no parachute. You know what? To be honest, I never doubted him. He's such a good flyer. And a good flyer can do this. But it's not the flying skills that you need. What you need is a good pair. <laughs> <laughs> and good a good pair and, of guts. And a good suit. And a good suit. <laughs> so we, the first suit that we made, basic, just for him to start practicing in the tunnel, flipping on his back because he wasn't going to land on a net on his belly. Little by little, the whole goal was three suits. One for the basic practice, one for the promo, and one for the jump. But what people don't know is that he made over 200 jumps with a parachute, opening at 500 feet from, from the <gasps> ground, which is almost at... Yeah. 200 feet above the net, clearing the net, landing. I think I'm ready to take off my parachute. But opening the parachute just adds this extra level of complexity to the whole thing. It too. does. But remember, he needed to practice with a yeah. parachute. He just had to put everything together one day. That's it. Because this is not just a crazy stunt. This was a well-planned stunt that took a while to do. You know, And he pulled it off like a piece of cake. Yeah, he didn't a, land in the center. Hey, man, he landed in the net. Who cares if he did not land what, did in the center? Did people criticize him for that? People criticize a little bit. Not criticize them. Oh, my God. Why is he doing this so close to the net? He didn't land in the net. I don't care. He landed <laughs> he in the net. Survive. I got, I got, I got so many people email me because they didn't believe it. Oh, he must have had a micro parachute inside his rig. You can see it on the picture. I can tell that he had nothing. The only thing that he had underneath was, it's a, a, an upper torso vest, which is commonly used by, by motorcycle right, uh, stunt guys, just in case you fall and you don't want to break your back. Like a spine. It's a spine pad. vest, yeah. a spine pad. He had a GoPro mount that was coming out of the suit. You know, it was just that. It was just that. And what was special about his suit that well, you made? That this was a stride event and the company stride has its own specific colors. And that color is not 
doesn't exist in fabric. Yeah, it's kind of like an apple green, but it's not the same apple green that we have here. So we print the suit. Okay. Mm, we also mix some fabrics to make the suit tighter, but with more power. So he was falling a little bit slower. Hey, I'm saying five miles, not a lot slower, but five miles, hit a wall, hit a wall at five miles and hit a wall at zero miles. <laughs> it's a big difference. You yeah. see what I'm saying? So all those little things make a difference. On top of that, I'm his sponsor. He said, Julio, you're the one that has to make my suits and you know you know what I like, you know how, what I fly, make me some cool looking suits. And that's it. In, in, we made it happen. I still can't believe that he did such an awesome stuff. He's getting ready for something bigger. What? Yeah, I still don't know what it is. I have a little idea. Uh, I hope he calls me. Most <laughs> likely he will. Um, but he's an awesome guy, you know. He's he, and oh, it's crazy. That was <laughs> one of the most impressive stunts I've ever seen. And but I saw it. My wife and kids were there, and uh, it was super cool. It was super cool to see something like that. I mean, I work with Luke also and uh, Felix von Garner, the guy that jumped from the stratosphere like mm -hmm. four or five years, like four years ago. Mm -hmm. You're listening to The Art of Manufacturing. Follow our adventures on Instagram and Twitter at Art of MFG. And to chat with other like-minded creators, join the Art of Manufacturing Facebook group. We'll be right back after this break. I want to give a shout out to Innovation Protocol. They're a brand strategy and design firm in Los Angeles. I recently met with them to collaborate on brand positioning for Make It in LA and our new Catalyst program. And after a day together, they provided recommendations on how to clearly and authentically communicate the organization's unique value to our audiences. They gave me such confidence to have an expert team drill down and understand our needs so quickly without taking a lot of my time. And they provided help that was really on point. For more information, visit makeitinla.org slash innovation protocol. We're speaking with Julio Ruiz, founder of Liquid Sky Sports, a top action sports apparel company. We've been talking a lot about these one-offs, and in a way, it almost feels like a very uh, a very Hollywood approach where you do one-off, um, you know, set design, costume design, etc., which is super cool. Yeah. And then at the same time, manufacturing is really about, well, not always, but you might say, well, it's a little bit more about creating more than one of something, right? Uh -huh. So you do that too. You're, you're figuring out how to do this mass, custom, not yes. mass customization, but you're, how many how many suits do you sell a week now? We we sell like 25. We make like 25 so suits a week. So that's a lot. It's so, custom suits. It's a lot. Yeah. So like, how, are, how are you doing it? You're a small business. How are you incorporating well, these technologies to okay. enable you to do it? Okay. So- First of all, my staff is awesome, right? The sewers that I have, they're, they're not just machine operators. They're sample makers. These are people that just grab anything and they know how to put it together. They understand if I give them a box of everything, they will put it together no matter what. They know how to do zippers, pockets, collars, everything really well. When we manufacture a suit, we don't. it doesn't go through many sewers it just goes to one person that's it and that person is capable of making more than two suits in a day you know what happens is that the business can handle more suits in a week or in a day because the business is not big enough the way we are we can manufacture more we can manufacture twice but where am I going to get those clients from? Because it's such a niche company. So that's why we've been expanding into other sports. Because let's say I make maybe a thousand suits a year. If I can make a thousand carding suits a year, that's awesome for me. I'm duplicating my business. I, I don't need to duplicate my staff. I just need to be a little bit more efficient. The only thing that I would upgrade is that instead of cutting by hand, we would upgrade to our new laser cutter, which is the new awesome tool that we're buying very soon. And how but, much does one of those cost? Uh, the laser machine? Yeah. It's an estimate of $75,000. That's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah. But you know what? The company that makes it, Tucatec, is an awesome company. I made, I met them a few months ago in a textile show here in LA. And that's how we met. Yeah, that's how we met. I actually was looking for a new pattern making program. 
because I'm very fast making patterns. I make patterns. My store manager used to be the pattern maker here. She's really fast too. And um, I can make a pattern in an hour and a half or less for my jumpsuits. Very complicated. But I found Tuca to be so easy, so efficient. And when I went for the demo, I said, oh, this is what I want. This is what I want. And I bought it. And, and that's I, a software. That's a pattern That's a making. software. Yeah. And, and I bought, I bought not their everybody, software. Huh? Not everybody understands what yeah. pattern making is. Yeah. Well, pattern making is when you create the garment in paper. And it actually has the same exact measurements of what you're going to be wearing, plus seam allowance, plus darts, plus uh, notches, plus all these little details that when the cutter sees that pattern, he knows how to cut it, where to cut it, what fabric to cut it, where to put a notch, where to put a dart, all this stuff. And the sewer knows how to put it together. So this program allows me to create a library of custom patterns for all my clients because I create the same thing over and over and over. Like I have a bunch of designs, right? But I'm making them over and over. It's not that I created one type of suit and the other one is going to have a lot of pleats or this. No, it's they're, they're already designed for this. For this sport, maybe next year we'll come up with a new suit. But that suit is going to be added onto our line. And we're going to make hundreds of it. So what I do is I make one pattern, one base. And I know it fits well. All I got to do is I do basic gradings. Which a grading is, let's say that I created a medium. Well, I create a small and an extra small, a large and an extra large. And I have them on my files. So I grab that guy. I save as with the new name and I modify it and instead of an hour and a half in 35 minutes I got a pattern so the more volume I have on my library of patterns the faster I'm going to be making patterns pattern making has always been my issue here that's where every, everything gets slows down because we have to create a pattern but now that we have such a nice advantage with this program that's one of the fastest things that we're doing. So now what happens? Now my production is running faster. My cutter has a lot more patterns to cut. My sewers have a lot more suits to cut. We're moving a lot faster, but still we got to get more business. You see? So I can be really fast, but if the business is not there because, because there's more competition, one thing, and because it's a niche sport. So now we're getting in other markets, in other markets. We're, we're focusing now on carding. Liquid Sky, what, what I've always visualized my brand is, it's the top action sports line out there that sells the coolest action sports custom apparel. You know, going back to that machine, my cutter takes, let's say, an hour and a half to cut a suit. Once I have that whole pattern in my program and I give it to my cutter and he enters it on the system... He just puts the layer of fabrics and let's say that using the different materials that we're going to use, the different colors, a complex suit, he's going to take 20 minutes. So from an hour and a half to 20 minutes, we're talking that now I can make four suits or five in the time that he makes one. Amazing. It's crazy. The machine is fast. The machine is easy to operate. It's very small because it's not a high volume laser cutter. It's a sample maker laser cutter. It's just for one layer or two layers of fabric. But still, we don't have a market of making the same thing times 100. So we, there's no reason for me to buy a table where I'm going to put layer over layer over layer over layer, vacuum it and cut it. No, I can just put one suit, cut that suit, and in 20 minutes, I'll cut another jumpsuit. Hey, even if it's an hour, it's 30 minutes less. 30 minutes at the end of a whole week of production, it's a lot more because I'm already saving time on the pattern makers. So if I can make a jumpsuit two to three hours faster, instead of you coming here to get measured at eight and picking up your suit at three, you're picking up your suit at noon. One thing that I tell my staff, if we're, if there's no work, we'll find work. I'm not going to let them go. 
you know, because it's not fair because I hired them. They stopped doing all the stuff they were doing. And these people are really valuable for me. You know, like we have a really good relationship here. I'm not a boss. I'm, I'm a friend with all of them. So they understand sometimes things get slow. Maybe we have a, a bad week and the bad week might be that we cannot continue a production because it's missing something that or if it's a military order, which is something that we do a lot, the the order was not is not approved yet. It's verbally approved, but not a hundred percent approved. So we can't start it. We're making a big order for Abu Dhabi. They paid. And I can't start it because they haven't approved the design. I mean, that's that's an awesome scenario, right? Like <laughs> having the money up front and not being approved, but I don't want money up front. I want approval, payment. Let's make it. Let's get it out of here quick. What's the hardest decision you ever had to make? Oof. You know what? Like, I I can't tell you there's been a hard decision. I mean, maybe back in the day when I was in well-known in the sport, saying no to a very well-known athlete that wanted to get sponsored because I just didn't have the money to make a suit. Yeah, I spent money on the fabric. My employees spent time in the production. My my sewers got paid for that production, you know? So it's still money. It's still money. And maybe maybe that, that would be it, you know? But uh, this is an awesome sport. I, I've, I've been blessed uh, of the, all the opportunities and the success. I want more. I just want to grow more. I got so much to offer and people to see what we can do. And that's the problem of creative people that we're about to explode all the time (laughs) because we got so much to offer in designs, in styles, but we don't have time for it. Or there's not that person that it's willing to... uh, to give you the opportunity. We we got a really good opportunity the other day. There is this uh, YouTube uh, celebrity that came here for some jumpsuits because he started jumping, right? And uh, we made him four jumpsuits. And I gave him a little present of a custom jersey that I made for him. Just that little present that I gave him opened such an awesome door for me because when the CEO of the company saw that jersey... Literally, in a day, he was here sitting beside me, meeting me and offering me to be part of their creative, their art director's team to design their brand for them. Not for skydiving, just I'm designing apparel for a celebrity that sells thousands and thousands of units all the time. And... uh It's really awesome, you know, like that you get all that. And my background as a graphic designer helps me because that's something that I really love. Like for me, designing, I can be designing all day long. I love being on my computer, creating, doing jerseys, designing hats. I want to develop my my merchandise, my brand, not merchandise, because it's not only just the Liquid Sky brand. We do cool designs, but I want to develop more products and I don't have time. I need, I honestly need let's say an extra eight hours a day. If I could buy them from anyone, I just need an extra eight hours a day. I wake up every day, 5.30 to 6 a.m. I sit on my computer in the house. I start working and I put my breakfast, my hard-boiled eggs, but I don't eat them until 10 because I forget them. I just drink my tea. I just go, right? You know, I go crazy. I start designing. Maybe I come to the shop, spend a few hours, uh, because most of the stuff I send it via email, they print the patterns. I'm doing a lot of stuff that I don't have to be hands on here. And in my house, I got, I can concentrate so I can do a lot more than being at the office. But then I come to the office and I work sometimes seven or eight hours at the office. And then I go back home and I sit on my computer again. I still dedicate the weekends to my family, sacred, sacred as much as I can. I mean, skydiving? No, I don't skydive anymore. I started jumping in 1994. I stopped jumping like five years ago. I still do one jump a year just to, you know, get the dust <laughs> off of my shoulders. I'm not a, I'm not afraid. I just get a rig on and I go jump. I borrow a suit, a helmet, a rig, an altimeter, and I go jump and I have fun and I land and I say, man, I miss this. I miss this a lot. 
But I, I miss more of my kids. And if I was jumping, I would not be able to be with them. Right. One of the reasons why I'm working from home more is that even I'm in my computer, I'm still at home with my kids most of the time when they get back from school. Um, so even though I got to work a lot, I try to be with them as much as possible because they're growing so fast. My daughter, Juliet, is six. My son, Skyden, he's uh, eight. And he's just so fast. I, I want to be with them as much as possible. I also travel a lot. Like I already got like seven tickets that I already bought, you know, in my American Airlines app. They're already <laughs> booked. But I got like 14 or 15 more oh my God. for the rest of the year. I, I travel maybe 24 times a year. For work. For, for work. A- yeah. I go to places to measure people. I'm actually going, might be going to Abu Dhabi to measure 40 people. Really? Yeah. And why, I'm looking why at do your, I do that? You're why? sitting here with the tape measure. Yeah, my tape I measure. It's it. it's my uh, it's my Talisman? my best friend. <laughs> my cutting knife. People people see my cutting knife and they go, "Why are you using that piece of?" Mm. My cutting knife is been with me since day one. It's all taped, but that that thing I will never throw it away. I will never throw it away. If my son decides to keep my business, he will have to use it. Because that's been the tool that's been in my left hand for so many years. My bracelet is a aluminum tape measure. I love this. I love it. You know, I love it. It stresses me out. I sometimes want to like, I want to quit. I don't want to do this anymore. It's so much stress. But it's because, because I got so much, I got this responsibility with my with my staff and my clients. But then I want to grow. I want to get in more trouble. I want to do more stuff with the business. It just drives me nuts, but it's a <laughs> cool, in a cool way. You know, uh, it's a love hate relationship that I have because I love it so much. <laughs> I hate it so much. <laughs> <laughs> I love to ask everyone, tell me about your 16 year old self. And what, what do you think about you today? Me 16? Yeah. When I, well, I've always been a good kid. Always been a good kid, never did drugs, never drink alcohol, never did bad stuff. My parents raised me. What was wrong with you? Well, they, <laughs> they raised me really well. Wait, 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 sorry. I did drink when I was in college, but I it wasn't like all the time. I don't drink now. They raised me really well. And um, why did you want to become an artificial insemination? Well, <laughs> what happened is because I went to school for, for agriculture. So I yeah. specialized in animals, in the agriculture industry. And one of the good things that I could do was to, uh, you know, inseminate cattle. Uh, if you're going to have a farm, most likely you're going to have cattle. You know, if you have a milk or or, uh, or hay farm or meat, then I also specialize in shoeing horses. So that, you know, I mean, I, I liked it, but but my, my, my thing is uh, it's – designing more than anything awesome if you had one piece of advice uh-huh. that you could uh they wish you you had known if, when you were an entrepreneur when you're starting out what would you tell your what would you tell the oof, listeners one piece of advice that i would have well i did get one from uh from one of the pioneers in the windsuit industry yari he told me that clients will never be happy with their product and they're always going to complain about feeding <laughs> <laughs> and he said, like, be careful with that because they're 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 gonna always blame you and just man keep it calm and make sure that when you when you make your suits you you know what you're really doing so so you can tell them no it was your fault it was you measuring run and and it it, it is true but what we do is we have a Skype meeting or a FaceTime meeting and we remeasure. I said, no, you're measuring wrong. Oh, it was there. I have disclaimers. And on the video, it says, measure like this, follow this, do this. We're not responsible for this. But people still don't do not do that. No, no, not everyone. Not everyone. So what's the lesson that, that people can take away from that? Follow the manufacturer's instructions. <laughs> but if you are a manufacturer, what would be the... Uh Lesson learned for someone like you. That's that's not going to re- get resolved. Unfortunately, it's not going to get resolved because people are still going to measure the way they want. I can provide <laughs> them with better tools. Yeah. I can have a better video. 
I can it's about update the tools. I can update my measuring guides, which if you go on our website, you're gonna see it. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to follow. So how can people find you? Well, first we're in Burbank, in Burbank Boulevard. We have a storefront right here. Uh, <laughs> we're in the storefront. We are actually people in our store. Walking in, and we just had to walk in. I think that they just saw a cool picture outside, and they wanted to ask me something because <laughs> they real didn't customers. have skydiving face. They, I didn't think so. <laughs> um, our website is liquidskysports.com. We have another website that it's Liquid Sky Outerwear liquidskyouterwear.com. The outerwear website, what it does is just that we provide our mass production stuff like our hats, our t-shirts, our jerseys, our brochures that we also do for clients. Like let's say that you're a client that need t-shirts for your business. We also do that. Social media? Yeah. Social media, Liquid Sky Sports or on Instagram, Liquid Sky Sports on Facebook. Check us out. We post at least one picture every day on Instagram. They're cool pictures, They're too. really cool pictures of many of our athletes wearing our products. Awesome. Um, yeah, it's pretty awesome. It's pretty awesome. It's so cool to see you have really taken on a fascinating niche, one that I love myself, and I wish I could afford one of your suits. <laughs> well, whenever you want to jump, you just come and you tell me. You do, do you, you don't jump anymore, right? Not. I haven't jumped in a while, yeah. so it. But when, if I get back into it, I will definitely Come let you know. Suit. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we make belly suits, we make free fly suits, we make everything. And I just love how you're um you're growing and still keeping that custom yeah. aspect using technology. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Oh, awesome! It's super awesome. Thanks so much for sharing everything Thank with us. Thank you so much for having me. So here are my three takeaways this week. First, custom is hard. Julio has to balance lead times with always keeping staff busy. And he started expanding his business with new sectors like outerwear and other action sports that don't require so much customization. But each customer base has really different expectations that he's been adapting to. Also, design tools are so important. In Julio's case, the customer struggles with getting the right measurements, which makes it hard for him to deliver a product that makes the customer happy. So he spends a lot of time doing personal measurements, Skype calls, videos, and putting together tutorials to make the process smoother. As mass customization becomes a reality, I think one of the limiting factors will be getting customers to figure out how to tell you what they actually want when they aren't the experts. They think they know what they want, but we need front-end design tools to translate their vision into something that will delight them. Otherwise, they'll blame you. Soon, the role of the designer will be to create the design tools. And finally, I love Julio's passion, and I can totally relate to his love-hate relationship with his work. As an entrepreneur, your business can totally take over your life. So it's a good reminder to take care of yourself as a founder. But ultimately, it might be his passion that makes it the hardest to scale. He's still the guy who flies to Abu Dhabi to measure his clients for their custom suits. It'll be exciting to see if he can figure out how to balance between customer service and letting go a little bit. Maybe technology will help him get there. Time to wrap it up for The Art of Manufacturing. Tune in next Thursday when we speak with Brent Bushnell and Eric Gradman, the founders of 2-Bit Circus. Find out how they're reimagining entertainment with tech-enabled social games and a new micro-amusement park. If you're in LA next week and you're interested in financing for your company, you might want to check out an event that I'm helping host on May 23rd on alternative debt strategies. Check it out at makeitinla.org slash events. And as a listener of The Art of Manufacturing, you can use comp code AOM to come as our guest. For show notes, visit www.artofmfg.com. Follow our adventures on Instagram and Twitter at Art of MFG. And to chat with other like-minded creators, join the Art of Manufacturing Facebook group. Never miss an episode. Subscribe on iTunes or Spotify or your favorite player. And if you like the show, do us a favor and leave us a review. Or send us a message with your thoughts and ideas to feedback at artofmfg.com. This podcast is produced by At Large and Dangerous in collaboration with Make It in LA and other partners. Visit makeitinla.org slash connect to sign up for local LA events and news. A big shout out to Peter Brandenburg, the producer and audio engineer. 
Thanks for listening to The Art of Manufacturing. I'm Z Holly, and remember, don't just make it, make it.